Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. Before we jump into this morning's briefing, I do think I need to preface it by saying it's going to be one of those kind of conversations. It's going to be dealing largely with immigration, or rather with immigrants, especially from Africa and the Caribbean. Now, before anybody gets defensive or starts to roll their eyes and say, oh, it's going to be like that, hold your horses. There's been more than a few people ever since I did that Abbott Elementary video a couple of weeks ago who basically have been taking cheap shots at the professor in the comments section, and that being the case, I think I might as well go ahead and give a response, or at the very least, I might as well go ahead and refresh people's memories on things. And I think that it's important that I do, because apparently the talking point du jour that I suppose has been passed around by these folks, they must all go to the exact same message boards to get these talking points, is that why do the FBA attack immigrants? Now, I could just simply say that's not true. You can't show where people are just simply attacking African or Caribbean immigrants just because. I could just say that and leave it there, but as Dr. John Henry Clark said, but what good would that do? First of all, there have been many true soldiers from Africa who you see in our comments section, who you see making videos, people who have been neck deep in the movement when it comes to black empowerment. People who have made their bones and paid their dues. We got to acknowledge that because they do exist. That's a reality. The problem is these true soldiers are greatly outnumbered by the tethers, bootlicks, and backstabbers. That's a reality too. And we have to be honest about that one as well. There's a problem that's been going on in Africa for the longest time that very few people in Africa even want to own up to. The Africans have practiced small-mindedness, and they've done so for a very, very, very long time. I'm talking about thousands of years. And as I've long told you, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. It is this African tradition of trying to be narrow-minded that has left the door open for every gang of invaders since the Hyksos. Now, this is not to say that the Africans practice only small-mindedness and nothing else, but the problem is, when it comes to unity... When it comes to recognizing a common cause, the Africans have been rather narrow in their thinking, and deliberately so. And while it is true that the Asians and later Europeans did use a combination of guile and brute force in order to kick the doors open to Africa, the truth of the matter is they couldn't have done it without the Africans deciding that they were going to be more interested in competing against each other than against the invaders. The bad guys can see when they're dealing with a divided enemy. And this becomes a real stumbling block for black Americans who call themselves going to Africa to help out. What happens when they get there? Well, if they're lucky, they get the cold shoulder. But if they're not so lucky, the consequences can be fatal. There was recently an American black woman who was killed in Ghana. She was in her 60s, for God's sake. This wasn't some young pup who had never been away from home. This is a woman who had actually been over there for a while. And she was killed by people that she knew. That's what they did when she got over there. She was trying to help them out, and this is how they repaid her. And she's not the only fatality that's happened over there. It's happened to others, too. It's also happened in other African countries, too. Now, I'm not going to be reciting them here because I'm not trying to come up with a whole bunch of talking points that people will later be using and saying, see, 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 here's the proof. I don't necessarily want to do anything to prop up that kind of narrative or that kind of discourse. But I ask all of the Pan-Africanists, those ideological dead-enders, to understand that for the longest time, you guys have been asking, what would happen if black people in the U.S. went back to Africa, brought our knowledge and know-how, and united with our black brothers and sisters there? What would happen? Well, this is what would happen. Now, this is not the attitude of everyone in Africa, but the problem is, it's the attitude of a critical mass of them. As Mr. Harvey often says, not all, but enough. You've had African heads of state who have been taking shots at us, while their own citizens are breaking their necks to get out of those same countries and to try to get to the United States where we are. Now, what's wrong with this picture? But those immigrants from Africa, rather than call out their misleaders over there, they instead begin echoing those same anti-black sentiments when they get here. And this is done as a way to compensate for their feelings of insecurity at the fact that they had to leave home. So they attack us frequently. And this happens a lot, not just with immigrants from Africa, to be sure. You also have immigrants who come from south of the border or from Asia, whatever. All these immigrants, whenever they go to some other place that they fled to, they always start waxing poetic about home and talking about how home was so much better and their culture is so much better and their traditions so much better and much more worthy. Which, of course, begs the question, if you had it going on, why did you leave and why did so many leave? 
This is what happens when people go to a new place because they were not able to get things going at home. What happens is they overcompensate by attacking the very people who let them in. You don't see large numbers of people leaving a place if it's successful. You see them leaving a place when it's failed. And places don't fail on their own. What happens is the people who are there failed to actually build the places up. Now, there are many reasons for why that occurs, but there is only one cause for why people abandon something. And that's because they've decided it's not worth the effort, it's not worth the work. Now, what do you say if the Africans have decided that Africa simply isn't worth it? Black empowerment in Africa simply isn't worth it. What do you do with that? I don't know what you would do with that, but I can tell you what you can't do. You can't unite with that, not if you're trying to build black empowerment in the United States. Can you tell me of any black politician in the U.S. who has ever stood before this country or stood before a town hall or stood before any of their relatives and started denigrating the Africans the way that these African misleaders have attacked foundational black Americans here? Have you seen them doing that? Have you seen any black American politician who's engaged in that kind of anti-African rhetoric or decided that they were going to say, oh, these people, they're beneath us somehow? No, we don't do that. Even the black Republicans don't. They know better because we have a culture over here that says, hey, we don't do that kind of stuff. Even on the instinctive level, we understand the absolute necessity to be and stay on code. But the problem is, in Africa, they don't. So to ask, why do FBA hate immigrants? That's a lie. It's a pathetic straw man propped up by those who don't want to face the reality. In Africa, it's routine for the various countries and their countless different ethnic groups to denigrate one another day in and day out and to try to big up themselves at some other African group's expense. That's what happens over there. A lot of them brought that same tradition here, though. It is impossible to get unity from that. That's how you get people like that Acho character over at Fox Sports. And that clown, he is fast becoming the 21st century version of Clarence Thomas. It's one thing to run down black people or to otherwise lend rhetorical and moral support to those who do if you're in your own country. But when you go to the other side of the planet and do it, well, that's a totally different situation. And this disrespect happens frequently enough and consistently enough that you can't just shrug it off and say, well, those are just some exceptions or just a few bad apples. Look, if you want to be proud of being Ghanaian or Nigerian or what have you, that's fine. But you make sure you identify as that all the time if that's what you're going to do. People who are more proud of their particular tribal affiliation or with the specific country that they fled from rather than the people in the place that they fled to, that's a people who will never be free because what they're doing is they're living a lie. And while that sister who was murdered over there in Ghana happens to be an example of how extreme the anti-black American bias is over there, she's far from the only one. You also have a lot of other cases where if you just go over there trying to build, you find that they're completely hostile to your efforts. That's the problem. This is what they do to black people from the U.S. who only came to help them. Black Americans have only tried to help them. We don't go to Africa to colonize it or to subjugate the people, or to exploit anyone. In fact, we would love to see black people in Africa sitting at the table of power and starting to deal. We want to see an example of black people who are in charge of their own affairs, and more importantly, prospering on their own terms. Where else better than Africa could you get that to happen? But the sad truth is, we believe in African independence and empowerment more than they do. Not every single one of them. There's a few folks who got their heads on straight. But let's be honest. The reason that Africa has not stood on its feet is because of the fact that there's too many people over there who would prefer to be on their knees. The black Americans who go over there, they do it because they want to see Africa powerful and prosperous. It would be nice if the Africans did that, but too many of them are trying to flee and get a green card to somewhere else. And the forces from outside of Africa can see this. The Chinese can see it, the Russians can see it, and the Americans can see it. This refusal to stand and build up their homes where they are, this has made Africa weak. And these interlopers from outside the continent understand that there will never truly be any real opposition to colonization because that only comes from a united population who love their land. And right now, that doesn't exist over there. And it doesn't exist in Jamaica either. To insult and to even kill the people who have only tried to help them says a lot. Africans are embarrassed that the former slaves in the U.S. not only turned the tide on their oppressors, we won our freedom from the plantations, and we went on to become the most influential group of black people in human history. 
But we didn't do that by running Africans or Caribbean people into the ground. Our shadow looms large over the world. We have left a hell of a footprint. We punch way above our weight. That's not a brag. It's an indisputable fact. And yet not even once have we ever tried to denigrate or dog out black people from Africa or the Caribbean. In fact, we did the opposite. We tried to build bridges with them. We welcomed them in and said, hey, we're doing this for black people all over the world. We're not just representing ourselves. We know that we're representing black people from all over the planet, so we make it a point to do it well. That's what we did. We welcomed Marcus Garvey with open arms, something his own countrymen didn't do in Jamaica. When Marcus Garvey came to the U.S., only then was he able to get anything off the ground. But when he got deported back to Jamaica, he went back to exactly what he had been before he came to the U.S., and that was ineffective, because ultimately he couldn't do it on his own. He was going to need a support base of people who were on the same page with him, and that simply isn't the case there in Jamaica or in Africa. It's just not. And it wasn't just him, but a ton of other black immigrants found camaraderie and support here that they never got from home. And yet, a lot of these folks, especially the last 50 years, are displeased when they're among us because we made them to feel insecure. Not because of anything that we said or did, because we didn't say or do anything to disrespect them. And yet they repaid our generosity by claiming that their culture is better, that they work harder, or that they're smarter, or that they're uniquely great because of their ethnic group or their tribe that they came from or their country, whatever, even though they left their great country to come over here and be with us. Talking like us, dressing like us, making references to our history, a history that neither they nor their ancestors were part of. And yet, we always have said that they are part of our story. At least we tried to make them into part of our story. So where's the anti-immigrant hatred at? Where's it at? That's why we keep drawing these comparisons to the tethers, calling them wolves in sheep's clothing. And what we've done, we have done in the most powerful nation on Earth against the most virulent racism on the planet. That's what we did. We are not some mediocre or ordinary people. And we didn't do it by running away from the problem. We did it by confronting the problem. Now, by comparison, we had this sister who was murdered over there in Ghana. When you say black, nobody thinks of Ghana. No shade to my Ghanaian or Nigerian troopers. But let's be real. When you say Nigeria, people think of email scams or people think of someone trying to hustle a green card. Name even one influential Nigerian who is in Nigeria. Someone of the stature of any of our black American figures. You see, I can name some second-generation immigrants who went to Britain or the U.S., but who in Nigeria has planted their flag in Nigeria and built up home? And speaking of people whose names have become synonymous with scams, anybody seen Akon recently? I'll wait. Africa has billionaires, believe it or not, and they also fled. They took their money and they ran to Europe or the U.S. And this is the final verdict on how genuine all that talk about how much they love their home country is. You can't be sitting in New York or Dallas or California and talking about how proud you are of Nigeria or Ghana or of Chad or Sudan or South Africa or Namibia or wherever. You can't say it's better than anywhere else if you decided to leave the best place on earth. And you also can't insult, attack, or undermine the people who made it possible for you to even come to the U.S. and then turn around and ask, how come these guys don't want to be around us? That's because we got tired of people spitting in our faces. Now again, this is not saying that every one of the African or Caribbean immigrants to a man has done this. That's not true. The problem is a critical mass of them have been doing this. Failure is contagious. You hang around losers long enough, you become one of them. Or worse yet, you decide to let the losers be in charge of everything. What do you think is going to come out of that process? I'll tell you what you get. You get a kleptocracy. Losers don't build. They can only rob. They rob you of your money. They rob you of your social stability. And ultimately, they rob you of your future. They also can rob you of your self-respect if you let them. See, this is the problem that we've had. We need to have an honest, and it is not going to be a pleasant conversation because it's largely about correcting all of these wrongs that have been allowed to fester for so long. But the first step to change is acknowledging that there's a problem that needs to be changed. Now, this is not meant to be any sort of attack on the brethren in sorority in Africa or in the Caribbean. In fact, this is actually quite the opposite. This is a call to action to tell you that what we have done in the United States, you should have been able to do far, far easier in your home countries. 
There's no reason not to. You can't run from your problem. At some point, you're going to have to turn and face it. Either that or the problem is going to crush you out of existence. Now, what I will say is, though, we have done more than our bit to try to help to stand Africa back on its feet at the expense of our own lives. And we have found that the people who were trying to help were completely and thoroughly not merely resistant, but vehemently opposed to our efforts. They were completely hostile to what we were doing, and all we were trying to do was to help them. So now what's happened is, you've had all of these people from outside of Africa, from China, from Russia, what have you, and they've seen what's been going on there as far as they're concerned. Well, hell, if they treat black Americans like this, then these guys, they're just as ripe for the taking as they were during slavery and colonialism. And they're right, because the forces of anti-black racism have not changed. The times change, but these people don't. The white supremacists are the same as they were in the 1960s, in the 1860s, in the 15th century, going all the way back to the first invaders in Kemet. They don't change. So we have to be realistic about the situation that we're in. Africa can be built up, it can get back on its feet, but don't be expecting any more of the romanticism from black Americans about how great it would be to unite. We have to see some changes in Africa, and that starts with the change in attitude, not merely how they regard themselves, but also how they regard us. You got people from China, people from Europe, even a few Americans, I would imagine, who go over there to Africa, they start setting up businesses, and they make it a point, oh, we're not going to be having any of you Africans around here. We're discriminating against you in your own land. We're coming to where you are. We're going to discriminate against you in a country where you're 95% of the population. Now, to be sure, I don't believe that black Americans are ever going to completely and thoroughly abandon Africa, but what is going to happen is there's going to be a hell of a lot more focus on what we're doing over here. And what we're also going to be doing is to make sure that we get ourselves empowered, because the truth of the matter is nobody else is trying to do that. They're not trying to empower black people in Jamaica. They're not trying to do it in any of the Caribbean islands. They're not trying to do it in the black enclaves in South America. They're certainly not trying to do it in Africa. So that being the case, if there's going to be an example of empowered black people, I guess the same folks who inspired the world are going to also have to do it one more time. And that's okay. I think we're good for it. But you know what? I think that if they decide to drop some of this nonsense attitude that they've been having and start to be honest about themselves, their position in the world, and how they got put in this position, I think that the Africans and the people in the Caribbean, they could also shock the world too. But one thing is for absolute certain. No runner ever won a race by looking over his shoulder and demeaning the competition. And in the case of the African and Caribbean immigrants, when they came to the United States, they were not leading the pack on anything, and they're still not now. What's required here is some humility. Not humiliation, but humility. Time to be humble. Because when you had to flee the place that you came from because you were not able to get things popping over there, that's supposed to be an experience that causes you to be humble. That's supposed to be something that actually is supposed to reduce your amount of pride and get you to take stock and ask some serious questions. Someone who doesn't examine their own life, who doesn't ever take stock of the decisions that they've made and where those decisions have put them, well, that's a person who's either going to be directionless or dysfunctional or both. And what's true for the individual is also true for the group as well. So I think that the Africans have a lot of work ahead of them. But if they're willing to put in the work, They can solve these issues, and they can make Africa into a place that people want to get into instead of run away from. Because right now, what's happening is the people who are trying to get into Africa are people who do not have any good plans for Africa whatsoever. People who are only thinking, it's time to bring back the old colonialism, we're going to show these black folks just how little we think of them, and sadly, it's being allowed. See, it's easy to take cheap shots at us. Because we're not the enemy. We're not trying to do them in. We have no desire to. It's hard to stand up to those forces of colonialism. You got five or six little racists who come in there from Britain or from China or from Japan or Korea or from Germany or Italy or whatever, and you got everybody over there shook and scared. Now, what's wrong with this picture? So let's not have any more cheap attempts at trying to throw shade at foundational black Americans and say, how come these guys are dogging out immigrants? Nobody's dogging out anybody. What's happening is we're making it very clear that the 130-year-long experiment in Pan-Africanism is officially over. The experiment is now concluded. The experiment failed. The problem that some people have is that we are not being bashful about saying why the experiment failed. 
because there were certain people who were more interested in running us into the ground than they were with building up home. And here's the thing. If you really got it going on, I mean, if you really got your act together, then it is true that you're too great to hate. That's the reason why we don't do it. That's the reason why we weren't running the Africans into the ground or the people from the Caribbean. From our position, it's easy for us to be magnanimous and generous because we made history every freaking day. We overcame insurmountable odds. And more importantly than that, whenever you talk about black people, you're talking about what it is that we over here have done. We understand that we're waving the banner and we do so proudly. We're not trying to find a way to flee from the fight. We're trying to face down the enemy so that we can finally have peace. And my suggestion to the family, both in Africa and the Caribbean, is go and do likewise. The operative term there isn't go. It's do. Good day and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Frank Stalker, Ginger Vine, Chevalier Foster, Kenneth Dickerson, and Deep I-904. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black empowerment only exists because of you.